COVID-19 is in our communities and the number of cases is on the rise. So it's essential that we each play our part in full by following all of the government guidance. Only by doing this can we keep our schools and businesses open. If you're young and healthy, you may feel the virus isn't a threat to you. But someone more vulnerable to coronavirus than you, perhaps someone closer to you than you realise, is depending on you to play your part in breaking the chain of transmission. So I'm asking everyone to do their bit. Stick to the rule of six for gatherings indoors or outdoors. Wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. Wear a face covering in enclosed spaces. Observe social distancing of two metres or one metre plus precautions where two metres really isn't possible. Follow all of the guidelines about car sharing. If you have symptoms, self-isolate and get a free test immediately. If we work together on this, we can control the spread of the virus. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jonathan Gribbin and I'm the Director of Public Health for Nottinghamshire and I lead the county's response to COVID-19. None of us want our children to miss out on all of the benefits that school brings. So I want to let you know just how hard our schools have been working to ensure that they've all got in place the sensible precautions to receive back pupils at the start of the new year. But of course, all of us need to play our part in stopping the spread. So alongside the guidance you know about already, I also want to urge you to follow the guidance on safe travel to school. Please walk or cycle, or if a car journey really is essential because you live more than two miles from school, please arrange drop-offs well away from the school itself. You can find out more details about this and about all of the other government guidance on our website. If you've any questions about plans or arrangements at a particular school, then the school itself will be the best place to answer them. Thank you for watching. My name's Jonathan Gribbin. I'm the Director of Public Health for Nottinghamshire County. And I'd like to tell you about the COVID-19 Local Outbreak Control Plan for Nottinghamshire. It's all about containing the virus so that we can protect one another safeguard our critical services and enable our schools, our workplaces, our communities to flourish again. And the plan describes how we will do that in Nottinghamshire. It complements the national test and trace arrangements and it builds on local arrangements with key partners like Public Health England, the District and Borough Councils, the City Council and our local NHS. It identifies a range of settings such as schools, workplaces, universities, care homes and so on, which require specific plans to deal with any fresh outbreaks of the virus. It describes how we'll be monitoring on a daily basis to spot if there are any new outbreaks and then coordinating action to investigate and deal with them deploying extra testing capacity if we need to, or contact tracing as appropriate. The plan also deals with how we will continue to provide support for people who are made vulnerable because they need to self-isolate, and we'll be doing that through our community support hub. And we'll refine the plan as we go along to reflect the latest best practice and the information which the government will be providing to the council. Finally, I want to acknowledge the lengths to which so many people and organisations have gone to already in recent months to stick with the guidance, to maintain social distancing 
of two meters wherever possible. To wash your hands thoroughly and frequently. To stay at home if you or someone in your household has symptoms. To get tested and to follow the advice that you receive when you get the result. By observing the guidance, you're protecting not only your own life and livelihood, that of your friends and also your loved ones, but also that of people you may never meet, but people who you're depending on and whom we must each depend as well. Your role in that is critical. Thank you for your help to contain the virus. Hello, my name's Jonathan Gribbin and I'm the Director of Public Health for Nottinghamshire and I lead the county's response to COVID-19. None of us want our children to miss out on all of the benefits that school brings. So I want to let you know just how hard our schools have been working to ensure that they've all got in place the sensible precautions to receive back pupils at the start of the new year. But of course, all of us need to play our part in stopping the spread. So alongside the guidance you know about already, I also want to urge you to follow the guidance on safe travel to school. Please walk or cycle or if a car journey really is essential because you live more than two miles from school, please arrange drop-offs well away from the school itself. You can find out more details about this and about all of the other government guidance on our website. If you've any questions about plans or arrangements at a particular school, then the school itself will be the best place to answer them. Thank you for watching. COVID-19 is in our communities and the number of cases is on the rise. So it's essential that we each play our part in full by following all of the government guidance. Only by doing this can we keep our schools and businesses open. If you're young and healthy, you may feel the virus isn't a threat to you. But someone more vulnerable to coronavirus than you Perhaps someone closer to you than you realise is depending on you to play your part in breaking the chain of transmission. So I'm asking everyone to do their bit. Stick to the rule of six for gatherings indoors or outdoors. Wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. Wear a face covering in enclosed spaces. Observe social distancing of two metres, or one metre plus precautions where two metres really isn't possible. Follow all of the guidelines about car sharing. If you have symptoms, self-isolate and get a free test immediately. If we work together on this, we can control the spread of the virus. Thank you. Right, good morning everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting of the committee, which is being held remotely, with the majority of the 11 members joining the meeting from their homes. As well as myself, the other members present in the meeting today are councillors Martin Wright, who is the vice chair, John Doddy, Kevin Greaves, John Longdon, David Martin, Liz Plant, Kevin Rostens, Stuart Wallace, Mira Wise and Yvonne Woodhead. Health Watch Nottingham and Nottinghamshire is represented at today's meeting by Ajita Biswas. Uh, we will be joined today by a number of NHS representatives to inform our discussion. These are Anne-Marie Newham, Executive Director of Nursing, Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust, 
Sharon Krieber, Deputy Director of Business Development and Marketing, Nottinghamshire Health Care Trust. Idris Griffiths, Chief Officer, NHS Bassett Law Clinical Commissioning, Commissioning Group. That's easy for you to say. Uh, Dr. Victoria McGregor Riley, Deputy Chief Officer and Director of Strategy, NHS Bassett Law Clini Clinical Commissioning Group. Dr. Tim Noble, Medical Director, Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospital, and Hazel Johnson, Medical Director. We also have the following officers present today. Martin Gately, Health Scrutiny Lead, and Noel McMenamin, McMenamin, that's close, clerk to the committee. This is the second virtual meeting of the Health Scrutiny Committee to be held in line with the new requirements of the Coronavirus Act 2020. Please do bear with us if we experience any technical issues. If we do lose any members from the call temporarily, then officers will seek to assist in getting them uh, reconnected as soon as possible, hopefully without the need to hold proceedings. Officers will inform the meeting if they are unable to rectify the problem and if we need to uh, need the meeting to be paused or adjourned temporarily. During the discussion, I would ask that members refer to agenda packs, pages, numbers, referring to points within the committee papers. Are we all happy with that? Yeah. Okay. The way I'll do do it then, if we need to do a vote, sometimes we do. Um, I'll just do it that we it's everybody's in favour, unless you're not, and then you can say that you're not, and that's the way we'll do it. Okay. Uh, item one then. Minutes of the last meeting held on seventh of July, twenty twenty. Are we all in favour with the minute? Anything from that? Okay. Uh, apologies for absence. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, no apologies as such, but uh, Councillor Longdon is substituting for Councillor Butler today. Thank you. Can I give um, Dr John Bruins apologies? I'm standing in for Dr John Bruin. He actually, um, his father passed away uh, last week, so he's organising the funeral this week. Can you state your name then? Because obviously this is live and then people know who you are. Yeah, my name's Anne Maria Newham. I'm the Executive Director of Nursing, AHPs and Quality for Nottinghamshire Healthcare Foundation Trust. Thank you very much. Thanks. We'll make a note of that, Anne Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Declarations of interest. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? Do any members or officers uh, present have any private interest, pecuniary or non pecuniary, to declare? No. Right, item four then, Healthcare Trust response to Care Quality Commission inspection. Uh, introduces the report, committee has heard previously about the Care Quality Commission inspection of the Healthcare Trust and the actions being taken towards improvement. I welcome Anne-Marie Newham uh, to provide us with the latest position. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much. Um, so, I joined the trust at the end of January this year and um, and COVID hits very, very quickly um, into my tenor in, in post. It did mean that um, we had to um, run in parallel our improvements for our from our CQC inspection, as well as running everything to do with COVID, as I'm sure you're aware. So I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a rundown, really, of where we're at and what's been happening. So we had a, an inspection of our core services um, from the 22nd of January to the 7th of March 2019. And that report was published on the 24th of May 2019. And that is what you had in front of you for the last two meetings in respect of the improvements we were making. And then on the 8th to the 14th of November 2019, we also received an unannounced inspection of Rampton Hospital as well, and they came out as inadequate. We got no enforcement notices, which is very, very unusual. To get inadequate, you normally get enforcement notices, but we had no enforcement notices, but we did get four requirement notices at that point. That uh, report was published in January 2020. So, um, going forward, we've had three unannounced mini inspections since we last spoke to you by the CQC. We had one on um, the 14th of February, um, which was at Lucy Wade Ward, 
um, and that's an adult mental health ward. Um, they came, um, like I said, unannounced, and um, we had a really uh, good, up, um, upbeat report from that. The only thing they did pick up was that um, we still had some problems with our staffing um, and increased use of bank and agency. We then had our second unannounced inspection at Rampton of our National Learning Disability Services, which is five wards, and they came in on the 10th, 11th and 12th of March 2020, and that report was published on the 10th of May 2020. And that was a really good report. It came out as um, good staffing, good multidisciplinary team working, good complaints process, and very happy with the safeguarding processes that they were able to see. And then the third unannounced inspection, which is what you can see in the report that you have in front of you, was from the 19th to the 29th of July, 2020. And they came into the adult mental health services. They went to Highbury and they went to Bassett Law. Um, and they said that they saw significant improvements and that we had provided safe care. The reason I want to talk about those three unannounced inspections is that because they are mini inspections and because of what's happening with COVID and CQC, they cannot change our rating. Um, and that's a really important factor is that it doesn't matter how much they tell us now that they are significantly improved or that they are, are happy with what they've seen. Um, the relationships are good. They can't change the ratings. So we still have a requires improvement overall for our main inspection and we still have inadequate for Rampton. What we have received from the CQC, and I would be happy to share it with you all, is that on the 11th of September 2020, we received a letter from the CQC that gave assurance on our care, monitoring risk and taking actions. And the reason that they gave us that is because um, we were continuing to have this inadequate label hanging over us when they had actually um, inspected us and found us to be improved. So that's why they sent us that letter so that we can use that letter. Um, so I just wanted to also say to you as well that we should have been inspected at the beginning of June 2020. They came and told us that. They've, been, they've admitted and they said you absolutely should have been inspected and that would have been a full core inspection with 70, 80 inspectors across the whole of all of our services. Uh, but they said because of COVID they've had to defer that. Um, they can't tell us when we will be inspected again. Um, although they've given us a bit of an indication that they still want to do Arnold Lodge, which is in Leicester, which is our medium secure unit. So that's the that's the story so far. And then when the report came to us in um, sep September of this year, um, they felt that the improvements that we had made were really good. They found that they they found really good interactions between patients and staff. Um, they felt that uh, there was a really positive experience of uh, using services. They felt that staff, when they spoke to staff, there was a real change in behaviour and cultures from staff themselves. They felt that when they came to talk to staff, um, they were almost really like, let me tell you all about the good stuff. Let me talk, talk you through what we've seen. Um, can I show you this example of something that we've done? And they said that they've previously never really seen that. They've never really seen a member of staff say, come and have a look at this great work that we're doing with these patients. Um, there was also the right, um, right amount of um, staff on the wards. The other thing about staffing, which was always previously in the inspections, was that we had poor staffing and that we had high use of bank and agency. What they've said is that their staffing levels are hugely improved. In fact, by the end of October this year, we will only have 14 vacancies across the whole of Rampton, which is unheard of. It normally sits at 70 to 80, but we will have 14 um, vacancies. So they felt that when they visited the adult mental health wards, that the um, staffing numbers were good. They felt that the clinic rooms were clean, tidy. The other thing that has happened because of COVID is that we've had to do a board assurance framework around our infection prevention and control procedures, guidance, and we are now being nationally monitored around IPC. And so the other thing we've had to do is we've had to do a self-assessment that has been sent in, and the CQC have rated us against that. 
and have given us the all clear at our last board. Um, the other thing we've just say is that was picked out in the inspections that you've got the improvement plan in front of you. So what happened is when they came in July, they signed off a lot of the improvements that you can see in the big spreadsheet. So what the CQC said is we can see that you have done that work. So that was some of the assurance that we were given around some of the embedding of the work. Because one of the big things that we have a problem with is we go in, we do it, and then three months later, it goes back to the old ways. What we're finding now is we're much better at that sustainable change. We're much better at embedding and we're much better at being able to go back and say, actually, that's there now one year later. Um, so the physical health care work that we've done is really, really good. The CQC said that they saw really good care plans, really good risk assessments. We've got more physical health care nurses working in mental health now. We've got a really good um, process of uh, physical observations that are required on a regular basis as well. The other thing to just note is that because of Rampton's inadequate, we were required to have a monthly meeting with NHSI, CQC, NHS England, um, and also uh, the GMC and Health Education England. So we had the world and his wife uh, meeting us every single month, and it was called a Rampton Risk Review. And that has just been stepped down by all the external partners because they feel that we are in a really good place now and they don't feel the need to come and meet with us on a monthly basis. So the other thing is that um, um, I suppose the emphasis really is that we can't change our ratings until we're reinspected, And that's the position we sit in today. So I'm happy to take any questions. The improvement plan you have in front of you um, is, is big, it's detailed, there's a lot in there, but if you look at it, so it goes from page to page. So the first page, page is adult mental health, your second uh, tab and page is community, um, your third tab and page is child and mental health services, uh, which we call short for CAMS, um, and your next page is learning disabilities in the community and then your next page is crisis and then the last page of course is Ram is Rampton and forensics and so what we've done is we've made sure that every time we're inspected we add it to this spreadsheet so we don't have lots of versions we have one version of the truth and this is what we sort of like uh, go by and this comes to every quality committee it goes to every adult mental health improvement board and it goes to every Rampton improvement board as well. OK, thank you. Thank you. And before I just hand over to the uh, committee, can can I just ask that when you're not speaking anybody, can you make sure you're on mute? Yeah, because we, we're getting some sign news. We've muted everybody now, so you're all on mute at the moment. So that uh, consequently, remember to take yourself off mute when you go to speak. Um, John, you did. Can you also use your hands? You've got that hand device on there, so I can see who actually wants to wants to say anything. John Dodder, you did have it up. Was it by mistake? It, no, it wasn't by mistake. It was just that you were <clears throat> so efficient this morning that you got through the minutes at the last meeting so quickly. By the time I had blinked, you had moved on to point four, five, or six. I was I was only going to ask if um, Mrs. Uh, Ellison Dodge had provided the responses to the questions on antibody testing and phlebotomy services on uh, the point uh, seven. Uh, but you got through so quickly, and you didn't notice my hand. I might have to start putting two hands up just to see if I can attract more attention. Uh, but you could deal with that at any time. I would have put my hand up, so I might as well ask a question now while I'm there and we've got the attention um, of Anne, uh, Maria, etc. Um, ligature cuttings seem to get a disproportionate amount of uh, publicity and obviously they're one of those that jump into people's uh, uh, notion that somebody is lying and getting strangled on the floor and nobody knows where to find the ligature cuttings. 
I imagine it's quite a, a rarity in itself that you would probably use them. Uh, and um, it doesn't seem to me to be an insurmountable puzzle, like everybody would know where a defibrillator was, or everybody would know where the oxygen was, or everybody would know where the kettle was to make a cup of tea. It doesn't seem to me to be an insurmountable hurdle that they might know where the cutters are, and uh, whether or not there's a person nominated at the start of every shift or whatever to 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 pass it on to the next shift. And the, the second thing I was just looking at was the, the chief pharmacist with regard to, to medications. It is probably the, the single most practiced thing for any CQC visit in the history of mankind to make sure that you check every single medication to make sure it's in date. It's probably uh, whether or not that be a blood bottle, whether or not that be uh, uh, anything that you use, whether that be a dressing pack, whether that be a medication, it's, it's probably the first thing that every building and institution does is make sure that everything is in date. So it is a little bit uh, uh, odd that there wasn't any there, although I see that you were using some of them for training purposes. Uh, and obviously the second thing is overcrowding, particularly fridges, where temperatures are affected by overcrowding and you had overcrowding of medicines on the cabinets and it does lead itself to mess and then mess leads to mistakes. Uh, I don't know whether you need a bigger cabinet, I don't know whether you need lesser medication, I don't know whether everything needs to be in the uh, nomad type dispensing services. I look after a unit uh, for secure kids and we can only prescribe X amount of medication, 28 re reflecting one month. Everything is in a card. Every drug is in a separate card for every single person we look after. Uh, and there is an element of fail safe about it because as the trolley goes round, everything is cardexed. And therefore, you can't actually overcrowd it. You can't actually mix up the drugs. You can't actually give anybody the wrong medication because it's all cardexed individually and for each individual drug and each individual individual. So um, I suspect that um, these are things which are easily rectified. But other than that, I think you're doing some fantastic work and I have no doubt whatsoever when CQC come back that you will get your regrading. It seems a little unfair that you haven't got it now, so I feel a bit disappointed for you. Um, but they're just the two things that jump out at me when I was reading through things other than the other fantastic improvements you've made. Uh, thanks, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much, Councillor Dodder. Can I answer a couple of the question, queries that you put forward? Would that be OK, Councillor Gurlin? Yeah, no, that's what you're here for. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous. So can I just can I just mention ligature cutters? You're absolutely right. Um, what we've done um, is quite innovative, actually. I've not seen it in another trust before, and I, I, ha I am quite an experienced director. This is my first, first, fourth director of nursing post, and I was lucky enough to go to, go to East London Mental Health Trust, which is one of the very first trusts to get um, um, outstanding. And one of the things that we've done in the trust is we've got something called a green board and that is where you all go so you automatically know even if you're a bank member of staff an agency member of staff or a new member of staff you will know that the green board is where you get your ligature cutters from where you get your defib from where you get your oxygen from so it's a really lovely spaced out board that you can immediately go to we didn't have that up until about um, 12 months ago that was not in every place and that is there now so the ligature cutters you're absolutely right it's there very clearly for people to see and then and the second question you did on the pharmacy, I think you make a very good point, but we have some very old buildings that we're working out of still. And I think some of the environments don't lend themselves to having the space to be able to have more fridges um, to take some of the medicines. And we have to remember that some of our mental health patients, as, you, as you've rightly said, have five to ten medicines each. Um, and so that's a lot of medicines to have in one space. But one of the big things that you've got in front of you is the memo from um, Matthew Ellswood, which is the chief pharmacist, which is about the new process of ensuring that all old medicines are um, taken away as soon as possible um, rather than hanging around. And we do use them for training purposes. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, 
out of date for um, out of date drugs have been a problem in the past but we seem to have a very very good clear understanding now of the importance of making sure they've gone because we can run into problems if we've got to out of date drugs thank you john to come back john are you all right hey no that's absolutely crystal clear thanks Anne maria lovely thank you i've now got kevin greaves please Unmute myself, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Anne Marie, for coming along. And uh, you come across very clear. Um, just a couple of questions I'd like to ask. Uh, in January, you were saying that uh, there were uh, some faults at uh, Rambe, uh, of, at Rabton, sorry, of uh, faults there. Can you remind us what them faults were? Um, yes. How did you put in, in over that period till March, I believe, 10, 11th, 12th of March? Um, how, how, soon, how, how soon did you uh, remedy these faults? Were they major faults or were they minor faults? Uh, and, the other, and the other thing, the other question is, is will you not find now under the uh, uh, state of the country and uh, uh, it'll make it a lot easier to fill job vacancies under the uh, present economic uh, conditions of the country, actually, because uh, you all have heard, just as, as we all have, that we have got thousands of people uh, you know, applying for a single job. So will you not find it a lot easier to uh, recruit now under these unfortunate, I'm going to say, conditions? And um, in terms of governance, how will the trust ensure that learning uh, from complaints, uh, teams meeting and supervision takes place consistently across the all sides? How will you do that, Anne-Marie? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, Councillor Greaves. I really thank you for the questions because they're all things I can answer. <laughs> so <laughs> the uh, first one is we were actually inspected on 13th and 14th of November at Rampton. The report was published in January. So we were able to start immediately that they'd been to see us in the November. And that's why we were able to make such a, a big impression on the changes that were required from the November until when they came back in in the March. And what they found was predominantly around safer staffing. They found that the staffing in the November was poor and it was down high bank and agency use. They found that staff were not um, adhering to physical health observations as required using News 2. Um, they also found that uh, there was poor um, understanding of uh, some of the medicine stuff that you've seen with regards to making sure that old medicines were uh, sent away and um, not used again. And um, oh, the other thing that they found as well is the um, therapeutic activity for the patients. Um, they found that it was being done, but not recorded. And so those were areas that we were really having to concentrate on with, uh, with regards to Rampton. When they came back for the two and a half days, they spent two and a half days fully on those five wards. Um, they said those are the areas that they felt we had improved the most on. So the areas they picked up in the November, when they came back in the March, they couldn't they couldn't believe the significant difference, and they actually used those words. And then with regards to jobs, it's a really interesting one, Councillor Greaves, because um, it takes a good five years to qualify as a as a, an experienced nurse, um, and and long much longer for a medic, um, and typically for a, an allied health professional, whether that be an OT, a physio, a speech and language therapy, you're looking at four to five years before you come out with a basic training. What they found with COVID, when we first put out the plea in March 2020 and we said, please come and help us, we'll take anybody that's either retired, um, people who want to do return to practice. Um, we had a flock of people. We had an absolute flock of people that came to us and said, knocked on our door and said, we're here to help. We want to, we want to really sort of like rally around you. Now, one of the national things that we're being told, and this is what we're experiencing as well, is nationally, um, the military have told us this happens in a crisis. Everybody flocks and they go, yeah, let, open the doors, we'll help you, no problem at all. The big problem is, is once the crisis dies down, people reevaluate their lives and they leave in their droves. 
and that's the thing that we're being taught um, and we are seeing some of that people are really reevaluating, particularly people in their 50s and that's what we've got a lot of people in their 50s in the nhs they're going do you know what i'm not sure i want to do that anymore I, I you know i want to live life in a different way i want to have more time with my family i want to so we're now starting to think about how do we bring in flexibility to allow them to do that and we're doing a lot of work with our um HR colleagues, human resource colleagues to say, actually, we've got a fabulous workforce, but how do we value them and say to them, please stay? And, and how will that work for you? And how would it work for us? So that's that, that one. And then the third one, which is my favourite, is around governance and complaints and listening to people and making sure that supervision is in place. I have a huge thing about supervision. I am the director of nursing. I have to ensure that clinical supervision is in place. And um, we did have very, very poor supervision rates. And I think people didn't value it. They didn't realise the importance, particularly you know, you know, around COVID, when you've gone through some terrible times and you've lost patients and we've had some difficult suicides um, externally, supervision is hugely important for people to be able to really say, how did that feel for me? What was that experience like? So we've now increased our supervision rates. We're back up into the 80s, 85, 90% for our supervision. Uh, we have a very, very good monitoring scre uh, scheme. Um, we have a system where you just go on and you put in clinical supervision, management supervision, safeguarding supervision. So it's a click down box. It's very easy to fill in and you just click in who gives you the supervision um, and whether or not uh, what was discussed you can is, is optional for you to add into there. So actually we're making it easier. We're not making it difficult for people. We're making it easier for them to do that. With regards to complaints, actually it's a trust that we do. I've really struggled with complaints in other trusts, but this trust does really, really well on complaints. We we respond quickly. We don't have a lot of um, re-complainers. So people who come back and keep complaining and say, actually, you didn't answer my response. You didn't answer my response. That is very low in comparison to a lot of other places. And we have maintained... Um, our response rates through COVID as well. Although NHS England and NHS Improvement said that we could defer complaints based on COVID, but we didn't. Are you happy with that, Kevin? Do you want to come back? Very happy with that, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, that brings me on then to um, Liz. Um, thank you. Th um, thank you, Anne-Marie, for... Um, a really thorough update on the progress um, that, that has been made and, and, and again it is a shame that obviously it isn't recognised in the rating yet but I'm sure I'm sure it will be when, when it actually takes place again. Um, I'm not sure whether um, Kevin and was asked this but I, I'm, I was just wanting to ask a question, it's um, point 11 on the um, improvement plan and it's about, um, it is about complaints. And obviously what it actually says is that um, um, patients and carers we spoke with did not know how to raise a concern or how to complain about the service they received. And obviously this is um, patients who have mental health issues or autism or mental health disabilities. Um, and so it is a, a great concern really. Um, and in terms of addressing it, that there is the, it makes the point that leaflets will be you know, put around um, I'm not sure that would be a great help to many of the patients. It, it's not easy to make a complaint anyway for anyone at any time. Um, so I would think that um, patients on this ward would need a little bit more in terms of, you know, a leaflet being left on a table. So I was just, there was also mention of talking to, is it oh, Speak Up? I don't know who they are or what they are, but presumably it helps people in terms of making complaints. So I was just wondering, is there any more um, information you can give me on that? and also how this issue has been monitored because it is a really crucial issue thank you no that's all right but thank you very much so i i don't think we've done justice in that progress comments on point on number 11 with regards to that because one of the things that we've um um 
been kind of, so we're a bit at the forefront of uh, how we work with people with learning disabilities and autism and how we help them to understand um, what's happening around them, what the experience they're having, but also then to say, look, I'm not happy about this. So actually, we've done a really um, big piece of work that's been held up nationally as being something that's very innovative about how we approach uh, our patients to say, you know, what's your experience like? What would you like to say? And we've done some really, and I know it doesn't say it much there, but it's very easy read things. So we've done this, like, what was my experience like? And you said we did. So there's some really good work that um, has occurred and we have increased their ability to be able to say, do you know what? I'm not happy with what happened to me. I'm not happy with what um, happened to my, you know, my loved ones. The, we've done more work with carers as well, because what we recognise is carers are often their spokesperson, are often the people that know what is happening and can interpret that for them. So we have done an awful lot of work in that area. Um, uh, so I don't think I don't think we've done justice to the progress on that area. And maybe it's something that we'll we'll give you more detail on. Um, sorry, Councillor Platt, I wasn't able to um, sort of like give you more in within that improvement plan. Oh, and you you talked about the um, freedom to speak up. So, um, the freedom to speak up guardian is a national um, innovation, really, that came about because of Sir um, Sir Francis's um, uh, findings. Um, when he felt that people didn't have somewhere to go to say, look, I'm really unhappy about the care that is being delivered. But that tends to be more for staff and every trust is required to have a freedom to speak up guardian. And we have one as well. Um, so I'm, I'm a... Um, I'm um, an executive reviewer for the CQC, and that is done ev in every trust I've ever inspected myself. Um, they do it in different ways. There's different models. Sometimes they have two or three people. Sometimes they're full-time people. Um, but actually, it's a very, very good um, thing to have in place, and all trusts have them. You happy, Liz? You, you happy, Liz? Sure. Mute. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, I would certainly be interested. And I think you're absolutely yeah. right that obviously the detail is not in this um, particular improvement plan. And, and I would be interested to actually hear more and more, and more yeah. detail about how that's dealt with. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, before I go on to the next person, can I ask you if you've spoken and you've had your hand up, can you put your hand back down, please? Yeah, so I know who's in the queue and everything. That'd be brilliant. OK, I've got Muriel next, please. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. And um, yes, thank you for um, what you've said so far, Anne-Marie. We do sympathise with the uh, lack of changes in the um, description of where you're at. That, uh, yeah, yeah, I know that must be quite... Um, even though people understand, it must be disappointing for staff to see it still written. And also, could you pass our um, uh, good wishes to John at this I time will do. for evening? Thank Appreciate you so us. much for that. It's very kind. Thank you. Um, just two things. One is about following on uh, Liz's question about um, complaints. What what sort of resources are put into um, providing advocacy for patients? Yeah. And the other question is, and I can't remember where I've seen it, something about mixed wards. Yeah. Um, the, the arrangements, there seem to be arrangements in place for protecting people's privacy in terms of showers and so on. But could you say a bit more about that? And uh, Yeah. Because it, in general, is something we're trying to move on from, isn't it? It absolutely is. Okay. So the first one around, yeah. So the first, so the first question around complaints and advocacy. Um, every trust is required to have um, posters up about advocacy for their patients. Um, so you have to have um, sort of like the ability for patients and carers to see how to access advocacy if they require it or if they want it. So that's the first thing. And then with regards to complaints. Um, there is, um, again, a requirement by the CQC, you have to have this up, but at the front of every single um, clinical environment, whether that be community as well, but you have to have um, it um, clear 
to all visitors about how you complain um, and that's also up at the front of every reception, every ward, every ward entrance as well. So there is lots of information up and we tend to have. Um, so the resource that sits behind that is um, a team of people that are on hand. And what we do, we have something called a PAL service, which is patient advocacy liaison service. So if people want to ring up and just say, do you know what, I'm really not sure about this, I'm really not happy about this, it can be resolved there and then. If it can't be resolved by the PAL service, it then slips into complaints and it becomes a formal complaint where you have to respond to it within 20 days. So we, we are very good at resolving at the PAL stage. So that's within 24, 48 hours of the phone call. So that's how we do it. And then um, the... The second one, the mixed wards, I'm glad you asked that. So um, as a mental health uh, learning disabilities um, trust that also has community health services, we have 44 beds across two wards in adult mental health that are, that are in dormitories, 44 beds. And we have 50 beds across four wards that are in dormitories in mental health services for older people. And um, we absolutely are moving towards um, single accommodation, which is what um, the majority of mental health services across the country have. Unfortunately, we have not um, had the investment necessarily from um, uh, capital bids when we've put them in, you know, nationally. Um, phase one, phase two, wave one, wave two, wave three. Um, we've not always been at the forefront um, and often the big bright lights get the money. Um, but um, we are working really hard with our commissioners who are um, recognise the importance of us being able to have single accommodation. When it comes to mixed wards, um, if we do have mixed wards, then you have to have a very clear delineation of that's the male end, that's the female end. And if they were ever to mix, then it would only be in communal areas like the dining room or maybe the kind of like lounge area. But you do not have, you can't, you're not allowed to. So it's very clearly um, locked off uh, female end, male end for the bedrooms and bathrooms and showers and uh, toilets so they don't have mixed toilets they don't have mixed showers and they don't have mixed bathrooms they have to be at either end are you going to help us get some money yeah. <laughs> are you okay Mur any, any any further questions muriel yes just yeah just a bit on birth really um i agree a bit with liz both about leaflets and posters yeah. that they can be encouraging about um, making complaints. Um, but um, in adult social care in the county, we had a long, long discussion with staff about, um, in, say, for example, <coughs> when, an, <coughs> when an assessment is being done, we now have in place on that assessment literature the, the specific question how has the family or has the person been offered advocacy? Because sometimes persons, particularly in mental health and learning disability situations, the patient's view might be quite different from the family view. And it, it's really difficult to negotiate. Yeah. So we've put it in as an expectation that people, that staff do check out if, if there is, if, if, if there is a need for or if there's a request for advocacy. I'd, I'd just be interested to know, not necessarily we have, a similar thing. We, have to, we have a similar thing. So there's an audit. You have to audit whether or not you ask right. the question and whether or not. So you, there is an audit trail. So there is a box at the bottom that you have to tick. Oh, fine. So I'd be interested at some stage of hearing really yeah. how many, yeah. how many people make uh, um, access that, um, that procedure. The other comment I have is that personally as a counsellor supporting people, I found the Powell's process is incredibly clunky because people generally out in the community think there is one Powell's service overarching. They don't realise that um, each hospital, each area of work has got its own Powell's team. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a maze and I, I haven't found them generally haven't found them particularly proactive 
And I just wonder whether, again, the the process for taking things to PALS could be uh, clearer and and also monitoring the effectiveness of anything taken through PALS. Because I know that they're, they're short-staffed and I know that their locations are not uh, complicated and so on. Um, uh, actually, on, yeah. on that on the PALS point, it's actually in our interests to ensure that PALS works really, really well, so it doesn't well, go exactly. to a formal complaint. So we yeah. do work really hard to make yeah. sure our PALS works well. Yeah, right. for exactly that reason. Oh, good. And the other question was just a, a, a minor follow-up from the mixed wards. There was something mentioned about um, uh, the has. Um, a bloke, a bloke has to get permission to access a shower at the women's end if that's needed. I just wonder if the, the situation is more complicated than a kind of clear division about where men and women uh, do any personal tasks. Um, I've not heard of that. I'm terribly sorry mm -hmm. if that's if that's no, your experience. I, I, thought, it was in, heard of it. No. I thought it was in the papers. Oh. No, um, we have to, we have a very clear lineage of the. Those are the male showers, those are the female showers. The only time it happens, and it does occur, is if we get Legionella at Bassett Law. That. Okay. <laughs> so if we get Legionella at Bassett Law, then we run into lots of problems of uh, showers okay. and bathrooms and toilets being shut. Yeah. So then we have to be very creative with the space that we yeah. have. I understand. Thank you very much, Amory. That's really good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Muriel. Uh, Martin Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, greetings to Anne Marie. Nice, nice to see you, and, in, and it's nice to uh, to listen to your answers too. Very, very precise and uh, enjoyable and, 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 and informative. Uh, can I just drag you back to um, a question raised by Councillor Plant on the uh, on the failing of the of the inspection uh, inspection report of May 2019, where some staff felt um they could suffer retribution for making comments or making suggestions or or even complaining and i was very interested to read uh, a few days ago uh that you'd introduced the guardians and and that's a, that's a great thing to do and it, it's an intermediary between staff and and the and the people they feel that they can't speak to so my question to you is are the people who the staff for want of a better word, fear, are they being trained? Are they being taught to, to treat people with respect? Because I always say this when Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust came to come to see us. Um, I know stories of the old PCTs and, and a lot of the staff who work for you now worked in the PCTs. And it was, I hate to say, it was a, a, a bullying environment. People were scared to approach, particularly approach team leaders. So my question to you is, are, are team leaders stroke first line managers having training to try and resolve the issues which have been there in the past? Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. I, I welcome the question because um, I think it's, I'm, I've done 38 years in the NHS and um, the idea of people being bullied in their jobs makes me feel very sad. And makes me feel like well, where have we gone wrong um, and one of the reasons I joined this trust is to work with John Bruin because I worked with him for three and a half years in Lincolnshire and um, because I feel that he brings the right values and uh, behaviours to the organisation so what you're describing in May 2019 absolutely was there because staff said it was there and they also said it in the staff survey as well so they didn't just say it to the CQC they said it on the staff survey as well and what we have done is a huge piece of work around the culture and behaviours I mean it's absolutely huge it goes across the whole of the organisation 9,800 staff and we've introduced something from the King's Fund which is like an NHSI improvement around values and behaviours to ensure that staff really feel that we've engaged with them consulted with them and that they feel that they are part of this organisation so firstly some staff have left which has benefited the organisation and um, they weren't they didn't have the right values um, and um, actually we wouldn't want them to work for us um, so that has helped a lot 
Um, and then we've done a big exercise. So the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians have been in post for three years. Um, and also what, what we've been doing is a big piece of work around, you know, it's not acceptable. Do not walk, walk past it. Those standards are not the standards that we want to uh, work with. We also have a new chairman. And again, that is a very, very different stance. That chairman, Paul Devlin, he started uh, 1st of January 2020, and he has made a huge difference to what is acceptable in respect of how we treat each other and how we value what each other brings to the table. So I think in, in answer to your question, I think there's a lot of work that has been done. The right people have left the organisation and we are on our massive journey of improvement around how it feels to work in this organisation. Thank you very much. Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Lovely. Thank you. That's uh, David Martin now, please. Then. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Anne. It's very nice to see uh, somebody who is passionate about the job and I can see why you got the post. Thank uh, you. So my question really is around how much has the trust suffered as a result of the uh, COVID impact on in the sites, you know, especially dealing with mental health patients. That must have been yeah. extremely difficult for both the staff and the patients alike. And I'd just like to have an insight on how you've actually coped with that issue. Again, Councillor Martin, I couldn't thank you enough for giving me a question I know so much about. <laughs> so, um, we had 16 deaths from COVID in wave one. The majority of those deaths were mental health services for older people and also patients that were at John Eastwood Hospice. So of the 16, the majority of them were um, older people and uh, John Eastwood Hospice. We lost no staff at all. I did have one consultant that was in an intensive care unit for three, four days, but I lost no staff. I did at one point have 30% of my staff off in the first month of COVID hitting. And that 30% was related to shielding, needing to self-isolate and also having symptoms. Um, COVID has been horrendous for us, absolutely horrendous, but it's not been as bad for us as it has been for the acute hospitals. The other thing that's very, very different for us is that um, our patient flow has not changed. So in the acute hospital, they've been able to stay, for example, stop what goes through A&E, stop what surgery, but it doesn't stop for us. Mental health patients still need those admissions, they still need those assessments, and they still need that risk assessments that are done on a, on a daily basis. What did change, though, is um, we immediately moved to about 80% initially of doing face to face from face to face into virtual. So we were able to um, uh, utilize video conferencing at length. Now, the big problem is that with this is I've just sat on a um, serious incident review group this morning and we had 20 incidents in one week. And one of the things that we're starting to think about is this. All of that virtual um, uh, consultation, how does that feel for the patient? Um, and that experience has gone where you have that face to face contact. And what we have to now start to consider as a country um, certainly I'm linked into all of the chief nurses across the whole country is what is the impact on patients when they're not seeing as seeing clinicians as much as they, they're used to seeing them. Um, and there was a thing about, uh, I mean, there's no fact behind this just yet, uh, but we will see the numbers and whether or not they come through, but that suicides are potentially going up. Um, and we keep hearing about this tsunami of mental health need that we will have of patients being isolated and the public being isolated and um, having to sort of like um, keep away from their normal activities. We've not seen that yet. Uh, we have seen more domestic abuse. Um, and um, we are talking to our colleagues in the police and local authority about the increase in domestic violence. Um, and we have had a big increase in um, safeguarding referrals for children once they went back to school, because when they get back to school, they're able to say to their teachers, actually, this is what happened to me at home. So that big referral, we did see that big kind of like uh, increase um, of referrals for children as well. But um, in respect of how it feels from a from a mental health learning disabilities community trust, um, I feel that I was on call last Saturday. I got my first call since May that we've got six positive patients on one ward, 12 nurses on one ward. And um, it feels like it's back, like it was in March and April. 
Brilliant, thank you. Anything else yeah. on that, David? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you very, very much for your candid answer. Um, and it must have been horrendous having to work with a 30% reduction in staff. And it was. We obviously know that um, it's on the increase again. And um, we, we haven't had that increase in waving suicides. But as you well know, that, that peak could probably come early next year in February. So I think if we were insuring against that and trying to do the best that we could for that, the detrimental impact of face-to-face uh, -face meetings like this team's meeting on mental health issue patients yeah. is horrendous, as you know. And they, they do rely on that, uh, going out, and actually going out the door is a, is a big issue for some people. So um, I thank you for all you're doing. That's all I can say, really. Thank you. Thank you, so, Thanks, David. Stuart Wallace. Yes. Are you with me? Can I hear yep. you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, th thank you, Marie. Uh, thank you for a quite comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. The issues that took um, the, the trust into uh, problems with CCG, except, uh, with the with the system, um, didn't happen straight away. They happened. They, there was a build up. You've gone through quite a, a large list of what I would call compliance issues in order to be able to put things back on the track. What normally happens in industry, I notice, is that once things are embedded, we think, then the uh, compliance is taken away. People get it as a secondary job, not a first time job. And you find the bad practices coming through the back door. So you, as, as I'm presumingly, uh, uh, as your corporate director role, that you are the responsibility for compliance across the system. So what plans have we got? What schedules have we got? And do you have sufficient staff to ensure that people aren't multitasked when, in uh, actual fact, compliance is one of the least things they're going to worry about? Have you got enough staff? And how will you keep those staff to ensure that targets are being met, that those um, corners are being swept clean? Thank you, Councillor Wallace. Um, I have a big passion for um, compliance because it's something that um, the CQC love. And if we don't get it right with the CQC, then uh, the scrutiny is uh, tremendous and difficult and challenging. So it's in our interests to get it right. So what I mean by that is that um, I think uh, we've done a big programme of work with all staff and we're doing this at the moment and I have fortnightly meetings with 120 leaders of this trust, 120 every fortnight, to go through what does it mean to be, um, to have assurance about some of the work that needs to be done um, versus reassurance. So I think as a trust, we were brilliant at reassurance, absolutely brilliant. So, um, and even I, I'm very good. I can talk, you know, talk well. I can give lots of reassurance to my board. But what I'm now teaching people is to say the so what factor. Tell me, come back to me and say, so what? what you know, have you embedded that? If I came to you in six months time, would it still exist? And that is the work we're now doing with staff for them to un understand what does assurance mean versus reassurance. And we're also saying to staff, what are your processes like? Don't invent things, have them already in place. So audits, we have a very, very comprehensive audit program that ensures we look at whether or not that work is embedded. Now that's an internal audit program. And we also have 360, which is our external auditors. And they've got a very comprehensive audit program as well that they come and do to us. So on a on a sort of like two yearly basis, we'd have a, a huge program done around some of our um, clinical processes, complaints, uh, safeguarding, restrictive practice, all of those things are looked at on a regular basis to ensure we are still compliant um, against guidance, nice guidance, and also our own policies as well. So we, we have a huge programme in place. Staff are starting to understand what does it mean? Oh, Anne Maria's coming back. That doesn't mean I start to clean and tidy up today. That means I should always have it in place. And what we're teaching staff is, this should be right all the time for patients. You don't put it right just because the CQC are coming, put it right all the time. And that is the change in mindset that we're bringing about in this organisation at the moment. Thank you. Go follow on, Stuart. You're on mute. I knew I'd have to say it. Oh, there you I are. I knew I'd have to say so, it. There you are. I, I, 
I would have been disappointed if I didn't give the chance. Um, yeah, thank you for th that. Is comprehensive. Um, my, my, just one question would be: uh, How often do the uh, corporate board discuss it? Compliance. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> every single board. There is a CQC um, improvement plan at every single board. And then we go through which uh, compliance actions have not um, taken place and, and which ones are off target. So uh, the board are cited on it, every single uh, board. And then the quality committee get into the detail, which is every quality committee. Thank you. So the board takes the assurance yep. and we're really clear. So this is full assurance, partial assurance, limited assurance. And then in the quality committee, we do all the detail and we do the deep dive in. Yeah, yeah. I say my experience tells me that quite often that that's the piece of the miss that corporate directors don't actually understand yeah. because they're too busy on other things. So I thank agree. you, thank you. I agree. I agree. Right, I've got I've got two hands up, but you've both spoken, so I'm assuming that you just forgot to take your hands down. That's Liz and Martin. Now, do you want to speak? Oh, okay, Councillor Greaves, I've just seen you. Yeah, go on. Yeah, you're on mute. Just. <laughs> just a quick, <laughs> just a quick question, Chair. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. Uh, I know she'll uh, know this straight up at back around anyway, but it's just to reassure us all. Uh, regarding COVID testing to your staff, yep. uh, how long has it taken to get results back uh, of your staff? And and do your staff have uh, are they having to travel far distances to get tests? Thank you, Chair. Do you know what? I couldn't have asked for better questions. Councillor Greaves, <laughs> fabulous. Ready? You're ready for this one. Right, so COVID testing. So you've got four pillars. You have pillar one, which means you have to go through the national uh, testing procedure. Pillar two means you go through your local trust. When the COVID outbreak came out on uh, last Saturday, when I was on when I when I was on call, I'd got um, six of my patients and ten of my nurses. The um, uh, Sherwood hospitals very, very kindly said to me, we will test all of your staff, Anne Maria, that have been involved in that. So 14 days before my first positive patient, I had 138 members of staff. So they said they would test 138 members of staff. They tested them on the Sunday and Monday, and I had the results by Wednesday morning. So that's how I knew I'd got the 10. And then for my patients, it's not an issue. But for my um, staff, if they are part of an outbreak on a ward, then Sherwood will test them for me. They're being very kind because we don't have our own testing facility because we're a mental health trust. We don't have it. So we have to really knock on kindly to Sherwood and NUH. So they do that. But if it's a normal test, so say, for example, it was me today and I felt like I got a snotty nose, then I would have to go through the national system and that could take days. Um, so none of my staff at this moment in time are having to travel to Glasgow. <laughs> okay, you happy with that? Uh, yes, yep. uh, yes, Chair. I'm glad to say that they haven't got to Isle of Wight or Glasgow. No, Thanks. not not today. Right, I, I take it that's everybody then. Everybody's had to say, yeah, nobody else wanted to speak. Lovely, right. Um, I've just got one question for you then, um, if I may, and is that you in um on page 37 it, this is about the um uh, medicines that, that yeah. were out of date and everything it says you're doing a, a quality first review have you do, have you done that now then yeah or, so it, so i've got a small quality first team that uh, yeah. consists of five people and then if i've got any hotspot areas i send them in and i say go and test out that area and what does it look like how does it feel what's the experience what are the first 15 steps like when you walk through the area and they've been in and done all of that so yes it's all on track brilliant thank you I, I, from from experience uh, I, I, I was a business consultant and cultural change in a business is often very That's difficult it. so you might have the right ideas and, and be able to put things right but if the culture within an organization isn't correct isn't right it makes it very very difficult and often can fail because of that and and i like the fact that you said earlier that actually had some staff that shouldn't have been there and you've got rid of them which is good strong management in my view uh, and and i just want to say marie and marie your, maria sorry your enthusiasm is contagious and i can see i can absolutely see how with you working there that the the enthusiasm within the organisation will, will improve and get better and 
I can only see you getting getting stronger as an organisation because of it. So well well done for that. I mean, you know, I'm nearly dancing around here. I, I was going to hammer you. I, was gonna hammer you. I thought thing. I thought the memo was weak. I thought this was weak. I thought, <laughs> you know, they need a really good kicking today. No, no, but actually, absolutely. but actually, you've 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 uh, persuaded me that you're doing absolutely the right thing, and I can see that. You know, I can't see anybody sort of disagreeing with you. That's why I got my MBE last year. I yeah, got well, an MBE they... from services to nursing. Well, there oh, you go. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say, in all honesty, I took uh, myself and John Bruin and uh, Paul Devlin, we took Lincolnshire um, Mental Health Trust from inadequate to good and we took it to outstanding for well led in 18 months because yeah. it was in the bottom 10 percent of the staff survey and that is what this trust is this trust sitting at the bottom for staff survey and that's the work we have got to do right that, all we've got to do then is make sure that when you get them to outstanding that you don't go and sort somebody else out then no and that, i'm you, staying that you, that you stay with us, right? <laughs> okay. So all that all that leaves us to do then is uh, to sort of consider what you've said and and, and what actions really. Um, what what would like to do, I think, um, and I'm looking for nods from people, is when you have your full inspection and get the report back. Yeah, yeah we'd like you to come back uh, with that result, and then we can go through it and yeah. uh, hopefully celebrate the uh, improvements that you've you'll have made by then. Are we all happy with that? I can't see anybody dissenting on that. Brilliant. OK, so thank you very much. That's really good. And I look forward to seeing you again and uh, getting so that much, enthusiasm really going really through. Real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. Right, we'll just wait a few minutes then while we get the uh, next people in place. Are we, are we there, Martin? Do we know? Oh, so we're all, all ready then, yeah? So, OK, so that takes us on to item five then, which is healthcare trusts improving acute mental health inpatients care environment. Uh, to introduce this item, we first heard about the substantial improvements of the patients using services at Millbank back in February. Uh, Millbrook? Yeah. Did I say Millbank? <laughs> you may have done. Okay, that's, okay, Millbrook, sorry, I do apologise. And and so I welcome back Sharon Kreber to provide us with the latest information on the proposals. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, kept this paper uh, really brief. Um, um, so I'll only pick out a few points because I, I hope you've had a chance to read <coughs> Um, yeah, we're really proud of this this development, and I know that the committee last time we met gave its full support, which was really welcome. Um, the acquisition of the site, so the, the hospital site that we're buying from St Andrews, is progressing really well. Uh, since we last came to the committee, we have exchanged contracts, and we hope to um, complete the contract um, about December, possibly early December. So that's going really, really well. Um, once we uh, acquire the site, I think I mentioned last time, it is a mental health hospital at the moment, but it's a secure mental health hospital. So we do have to make some amendments to the site, some modifications, some capital works, which we hope to get completed by uh, the spring next year and with a fair wind start to mobilise, operationalise that site from May next year. Um, if councillors um, perhaps remember our intention is to move the adult mental health services to the new site from Millbrook to the new site but retain services for old people at the Millbrook site and then the next phase will be to improve that site too. Um, when I was last here um, as councillors with uh, obviously an interest in Nottinghamshire patients she did ask about um, the patients at the St Andrews site at the moment and I was able to get some information from them and I have put that in the paper that's come from St Andrews. I did speak to them last week and actually what they told me uh, were that there actually were five patients from Nottinghamshire whereas the paper says four because that's the information they'd given me before um, and I can say a little bit more about those patients. As a committee, you were also um, rightly interested in how are we going to involve local stakeholders in 
mobilising this fight. So we have attached our sort of common engagement plan um, for your information. There's a bit of detail in there, so I won't go through all of that. But to say that that's going well, we've had some good engagement, for example, with naming the site, involving local stakeholders, 150 ideas, and we've now called the site Sherwood Oaks. So once we take occupation of it, we'll be calling it Sherwood Oaks. Um, and I think the comms and engagement plan can really come to life even more once we've got the keys. Um, fully expect this transaction to go ahead, but it isn't ours yet. But you know, when you buy the house, you haven't quite got the keys in your hand yet. So, uh, and we hope to have that um, early December. Just uh, for information, um, one of the risks that we thought were, it sort of probably last time we came to to, to see the committee was that. Um, uh, with, with the uh, surges of COVID, we were a bit worried whether St Andrews would be able to transfer their patients safely, and that's gone really well. Um, and in fact, they've informed us um, the last two or three patients will be leaving that site this week. So their, their aim is that by the end of this week, that site will be vacant. Um, so then I've just included the, the next steps in in the plan, but but all in all, um, going uh, really well. We've got a dedicated um, place on our website to keep people informed. We've set up a focus group of um, service users who are already starting to input in our, our messages, how we message, so on and so forth. So I'll perhaps stop there. Overall, a uh, really a uh, development that we're really proud of and, re and really pleased to be able to make this investment and um, and going well. Thank you. Lo lovely. Thank you very much. I've got uh, Martin Wright. You've got your hand up. Did you? Cause, is it because you had a question or you forgot to take it down? I didn't know I had it up, uh, Chairman, but I will stick my hand up. Is it still okay. there? Yeah, yeah, it's still there. If you if you want to ask your question now, then Martin. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. first on the engagement with uh, stakeholders. Uh, I don't know whether the local members are on the list, local county councillors. But it just so happens that Sherwood Oaks is in my patch and uh, we'd be very interested to be involved in in any engagement. And as I'm sure the local the local district council would, too, um, because there have been uh, in the past when it was St. Andrews, there have been one or two incidents which quite ignited the local community. So if we're involved, we can we can dispel anything, anything like that. Um, I have one question and, it, and it's it. it the whole thing's a good news story, um, but uh, turning the attention back to the site you're using at the moment, Millbrook, which which the report says is is isn't up to the current quality standards of uh, ensuite accommodation, and that work will follow follow on at a later date. Being greedy and being a Mansfield member, we like everything at once. So you're going to do you're going to do Sherwood Oaks without a doubt. Any idea when you'll start to renovate the Millbrook site? Thank you. You're on mute. You're on mute. I was so determined. Oh, that's another one. I, I think I'm going to win the tote today. Oh. Bingo. Uh, I was saying, uh, saying Councillor Wright, thank you very much for your offer and certainly we'll take that back into the team and uh, make sure we're perhaps strengthening that connection. So thank you. Um, um, quite right to be greedy and ambitious for your local population. Um, the, the, one of the wards at Millbrook Hospital is uh, single ensuite accommodation. Um, and when the adult patients transfer to the new site, that means at least one ward is, is the best ward can continue to be used there for, for older people. Um, we are developing our proposals now and we are putting a bid through to um, some national money. So the government's announced a national part for capital developments to eradicate dormitories so we are putting a plan through to that i mean realistically um i, ca I can't think that any major alterations can be made to that site you know within the next year just simply in terms of the planning and um, getting getting the allocation of funding um we will be able to make some modifications to the site to make sure that it's um suitable as i say one of the wards that older people will be able to use is better than the ward that they're using at the moment. And um, I think 
quite happy once those plans start to take a bit more shape to share those with with the committee so that you can get some assurance around that thank you very much janet thank you i've got uh, david martin next yeah good morning uh, um uh, thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, obviously, this is a plus. Uh, if you can just remind me, because I can't see it in the papers at the moment, the capacity numbers for Sherwood Oaks, and will the alterations at Millbrook reduce capacity? Uh, obviously, Ashfield Council would like to be involved in the decision process as well, because it's um, so it's used by a lot of residents from Ashfield. I'm on the very western edge of the county, actually, and. Um, we use Millbrook. Well, I don't use it, but we do use residents from my area do use Millbrook. So Ashfield, it's in between Ashfield and Mansfield. It's actually on the gateway. Yeah. So, you know, so we would be happy to be involved in any future changes at Millbrook as well. Yeah. So the um, buying buying the Sherwood Oaks, what we will what we will call Sherwood Oaks site, does give us more capacity. Um, St Andrews at the moment provide uh, sixty four beds there. Um, and uh, but they um, it's, it's quite a big sign. We we think that there might be the possibility to deliver 72, 72 beds there. Um, whereas the, the number of beds that are moving from Millbrook, oh gosh, the numbers escaped me. But it's two wards worth are moving from Millbrook. So there's there's more than enough capacity. Uh, it's not a shrinking capacity. That's that's for sure. Do you? Uh... Do you is your aspiration to make the interim changes and then apply for further funding to improve Millbrook further then is that what you're saying is it a staged process development uh, we're, we're, we're making the application for funding now so we want to yeah we do, we, we want to do them this um, concurrently so far as we can really yeah, yeah. Um, just um, the indication is that we may well be successful for, for, with um, attracting some central funding, perhaps to part fund the purchase of the St Andrews site, which then would potentially give us the opportunity to free up some of the money that we would have used that for the, the Millbrook site. So, but we are doing these things concurrently. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, just in terms of the actual um, timing of buying the site and then being able to do Millbrook will look like a phased approach. But we're trying to pursue the funding um, all at the same time. Yeah. So you'll be um, doing your alterations to Sherwood Oaks, moving the patients out of Millbrook, and then doing, yeah, like consecutively. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. It's just so that we can inform our residents because a lot of people yes. will say, oh, they're closing Millbrook, you know. Yeah. No, no, we're definitely right. closing Millbrook. So will there be a PR around it? Yes, yeah, we've we've had some we've had some um, already in terms of where we we exchanged the contracts. That was good news, and certainly once we get the keys, I think that will be the time for uh, uh, yeah. you know a bit more um, razzmatazz. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I haven't got any other uh, any other hands up, so I'll just summarise a little bit. As um, as Martin Wright said right at the beginning, this is a good news story. So um, we're really pleased about this because as I recall that. Um, you know, we had issues with uh, Millbrook at the beginning and, um, you know, we were listened to as a committee, which we re really were pleased with. And and, and uh, we'd like to think we've had some sort of influence in in, in what's happening now. So that's great. And I, and I know the Mansfield and the Ashfield councillors are arguing about who should be engaged more about, about it than anybody else. However, this committee um, would like to be in, engaged in terms of, especially with your, your public engagement, see how you're doing that so we know and we can see and that we're happy with that so that we do get the best results for both both the two sites um, and so I think that's something that the committee will need to to, to monitor as well as the Ashfield and the Mansfield uh, <laughs> councillors as well but uh, you know I think it's uh, appropriate that it comes through uh, comes through this committee really uh, so thank you for that um, I don't think then nobody else has got their hand up so that's that's the end of that item so thank you very much thank you thank you for your support Right, that takes us on then to NHS Bassett Law CCG Improving Local Health Services. To introduce this item, although in the past we've heard in great detail about the closure overnight of the paediatric services in Bassett Law Hospital, this is the first time we've had on the, on the agenda these proposed improvements to various services. Uh, I welcome to the meeting Idris Griffiths, Dr Victoria McGregor, Riley and Dr. Tim Noble, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll uh, be presenting uh, this and then try to give as much opportunity as possible for questions. Hopefully, everybody will have had a chance to uh, to read the paper. Um, I think it, so it would be helpful, perhaps, if we just introduced ourselves first. And, uh, um, and Victoria is here, but um, we've got a couple of clinicians from both of the providers. So I wonder, Tim, if you could introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll start the presentation after the introductions. Yes, by all means. So uh, I'm Tim Noble. I'm a respiratory physician. Um, I've worked at DBTH for 14 years. Uh, and I'm now the medical director. Prior to that, I was a clinical director of acute and general medicine, and I was um, um, completely involved in the setup of the assessment and treatment centre, which transformed acute medicine at Bassett Law Hospital, uh, strengthening its um, acute medicine assessment process. And for around two years, I was very closely involved with the Women's and Children's Clinical Governance as the um, lead for clinical governance for the division and oversaw a number of um, what I'd say would be positive improvements because they'd had uh, some areas where they needed to improve. Thank you. Thank you. And we're also joined by, I think, um, Hazel Johnson. Hello, yes, I'm Hazel Johnson. I'm a consultant psychiatrist in adult mental health and I'm associate medical director in mental health services in Nottinghamshire Healthcare. And Sharon stayed on the line for the meeting in case uh, there's questions that she might be able to help with. So um, I'll uh, do the sharing of the screen, if I may, and just run through this presentation um, quite briefly. So hopefully you can see that now. Yes, we can. Thank you. So uh, um, what we're trying to do uh, is to sort of live by these ambitions and opportunities. So first of all, we want to continue to work collaboratively. And as you can tell, we've got not just the CCG as um, represented by myself today, but Notts Healthcare Trust, who provide the inpatient medical, so inpatient uh, service um, for mental health at Bassalore Hospital. And also um, Doncaster and Bassalore Hospital as a separate provider. So we're working together, but also working for local people. Uh, we want to ensure that we provide clinically safe and high quality services. And that unfortunately was uh, becoming very challenging uh, for paediatric overnight services, as you're aware. And it was in January 2017 that we had to urgently um, close uh, overnight uh, and because of staffing issues. And that unfortunately has remained the position um, since then. We also want to support the ongoing sustainability and development of the hospital site. And I think this is another good news story uh, in terms of our commitment, but also some of the things that we now want to explore in order to improve the urgent care service, the paediatric service as it currently stands, and um, support for uh, mental health inpatients. So we think we've got a number of opportunities uh, sort of before us now in order to uh, to act on those. So in terms of paediatrics, we want to provide safe and sustainable services. And we haven't been successful uh, as a health service has been able to recruit the additional staff that would have allowed us to have a 24 seven inpatient service. So we've got a seven day a week consultant led, but any transfers uh, that are needed for particularly ill children take place after around about nine o'clock, um, most notably to Doncaster Royal Infirmary. We put mitigations to enable us to work safely in, in that way, and those services have actually worked, I think, very well after initial understandable concerns from the public. We've had no sort of significant issues or, or complaints with regard to that service. From a mental health point of view, the current ward accommodation um, for mental health inpatients uh, is really not as suitable as we would like. Uh, we have dormitory sort of areas, so people sharing same bedded areas and a number of other issues. It's not purpose built. It's not modern standards um, that we would like to see for mental health inpatients. And it doesn't provide that ready access to the wider profession, specialist mental health support that larger units were. 
Uh, and finally, the inpatient wards, uh, there's two uh, Massa Law, um, are of a size that uh, being more specialist service, um, being inpatients, we actually draw a catchment area that goes much wider than Bassett Law. So uh, there's only about half the patients that use that facility actually come from Bassett Law and other come from um, sort of other areas. So this is a pre-engagement uh, period, really. So we wanted to come to the Health Scrutiny Committee right at the beginning of this process. So we've started to reach out to key stakeholders, but we haven't started sort of a formal engagement process um, yet. Uh, so this pre-engagement gives you an opportunity uh, to influence and help us shape the scope of the uh, engagement, particularly with the public and sort of the, the interested parties and organisations. Obviously, we're very conscious that COVID is still going on, unfortunately, and that does provide some challenges in carrying out effective engagement. And we'd welcome sort of views on that as well. And of course, it's an opportunity at this early stage, while we're still developing the options, for you to contribute and influence those and to have any of your questions answered. So I'll leave it there and open it out for uh, discussion, if I may. But I don't, I don't have any hands up. Anybody like to ask a question? Councillor David Martin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, this has been a bit of a journey that's been going on for about four years, and it's been a bit of a difficult issue for uh, Bassett Law Hospital Trust as a, as a whole, because uh, if I remember the, the original problem is the comprehensive uh, educational, after educational package for student nurses wasn't really that attractive by comparison to the Sheffield Hospital. So that created the initial difficulty in attracting new recruits to Bassett Law's paediatric service. There was also a lot of local political antagonism, inflammation of the situation. And I remember commending Bassett Law Hospital at the time for um, laying on the minibus, but the minibus costs were quite high. And I just wondered if that was still the transition of patients from Bassett Law to Doncaster Royal Infirmary or Sheffield hospitals if that cost has been mitigated because I can remember the last time that you came to health scrutiny we talked about having more help from Yorkshire Ambulance uh, Service because you're in that peripheral zone of the two areas between EMAS and is it YMAS um, or Yorkshire Ambulance Service isn't it yeah. um, so patient numbers obviously were another issue because Originally, the hospital estimated that there were only going to be so many uh, casualties per week or per month. And that in actual fact, in reality, it turned out to be higher than that. Um, so I just wondered if if um, <coughs> that situation had eased it all. So my my real, my four things are the difficulty in the ability to recruit the correct paediatric nurses to your hospital is obviously still a problem because of the reasons I've just explained. But the, the minibus cost and the, the conflict between EMAS and Yorkshire Ambulance Services has a great detriment, detrimental impact on parents who arrive at your hospital expecting their child to be looked after and then have to have the trauma of the transport issue. That was the biggest thing. So I just wondered if you could expand around that area. Yes, I'll, I'll let... Um... Dr. Noble come in in a, in a second. Um, just a couple of reflections uh, there on that, Councillor. Uh, you, you're absolutely right that the uh, the challenges of recruiting specialist um, children's nurses in Basel Hospital is exactly the same, um, and that that's not going to change uh, in terms of it not being a sort of large specialist children's unit, which is the sort of thing that um, attracts, you know, some uh, frankly quite rare. Um, sort of quali rarely qualified staff. In terms of the transport issue, um, the numbers were initially higher than we'd envisaged, but they have now dropped to lower than we envisaged. So they've gone from perhaps, you know, sort of one a day to one a week. Uh, there's various reasons for that. Um, some of the, the children who have to visit, unfortunately, due to chronic illnesses and things, uh, arrangements have been made where they don't go into Basel first, they go straight to, to Doncaster. Uh, 
the it's also probably a sign that the ambulance issues have settled down so they're not as big a challenge uh, as they were we do provide still a private ambulance service in addition to um, transport for patients and relatives that goes between sort of the various sites so we've got two different types of transport going on um, we wanted to ensure that we had sort of quick and effective reliable transport for the children obviously um, and that does come at a cost and that hasn't that hasn't changed dr noble thank you uh chair and thank you councillor martin um <clears throat> just to say that um a really good initiative with the College of Paediatrics and Child Health was to mandate that we would have paediatric trained nurses 24 hours a day in emergency departments, two of. Um, and that sort of suddenly makes the nation short of paediatric trained nurses. Well-intentioned move and the right thing to do, without doubt, without the doubt. So we were suddenly faced with that challenge and there is therefore a national recruitment difficulty. Um, I think we've got a thriving department and I know I've been very involved with paediatrics and women's and children's and I know that um, they are very enthusiastic, they are very keen. We're in discussions at, at ICS level because we've got really strong partners um, in Sheffield um, who are supportive. Uh, it's particularly in training and, and experience as well. So I think we, and I know we have explored many different ways to recruit and it you know, we're, we're drawing in an empty barrel, I'm afraid, at the moment. And that may change over, you know, periods of five years, ten years. But at the moment, we're drawing on an, a, a difficult pool. Um, so I think what's been suggested um, for a future move is to try and um, improve how the teams work together. Because we've got paediatric nurses in ED and we've got some on a, on a ward assessment area, but they're not co-located. And that makes it difficult. And if we could change that... Uh, that would be a really uh, valuable thing for us to do. And as I said earlier, going back to about 2012, 2013, I was designing, because uh, I was the clinical director of the acute medicine uh, service, the ATC, which we actually wanted to tag on to the back of A&E uh, because it would make good sense, because radiology is there too, uh, but we physically couldn't move it. Um, this may give us opportunities to change quite a lot within the trust. Um, given appropriate funding coming. Um, so we're, we're very enthusiastic um, and we'd, we'd love to find out how you think we could engage well with the public to get uh, their involvement to help shape what we do in the future because what, we need to do something differently uh, to, to maintain the strength of Bassett Law Services. You got to come back, Martin, uh, David, sorry? Uh, yeah, I think um, initially... Uh, when you change the name of the unit from the children's unit to the assessment unit, that's what that was the initial. It was a bit of a political nightmare for you, yeah. you know. And I, I know, I know that people. Lo I mean, I'm not local to Bassett Law Hospital, but I know Councillor Greaves is. Um, <laughs> but and, and I know it was a very, it is a very changing situation. And for you to get paediatric nurses to work in that in that hospital when you've got the Sheffield University hospitals and Doncaster hospitals on the doorstep paediatric nurses are what those few that there are are always going to go to those services the other the other adverse impact of the change was of course was that people perceived that they could arrive at Bassett Law with their children when you've got an ill child and you arrive to a hospital and there's no service and you've got to go in a minibus to another hospital it's a living nightmare and that's what exacerbated the problem and I, I think you've got less numbers coming now because over time people have realized so they're better off going to Doncaster than coming to Bassett Law. And that's a bit of a problem for you as a hospital that you will have to resolve on your own PR terms, really. You know, because because people are now accepting the fact that they can't come to Bassett Law after eight to seven o'clock at night. So they go straight to Doncaster. So that's why uh, you've got an impact on that. And yes. only time could resolve that issue. And that's what's happening. Yes, I'm sure you're right. And I think, um, you know, were the, were the offer to change, uh, and were we able to accommodate children throughout the night, then we would have to do a significant amount of publicity to change that message. Um, but the message at the moment is right. And, you know, if, if parents are worried about their child and, and, and think that the best place is for an admission if, in their judgment, though they won't necessarily know that's necessary, but we, we would help them to, uh, you know, assess the child and, and make that decision, then it might be right to get the ambulance to go straight to Doncaster and drive-bys are an important feature of many of our services. Uh, throughout and many, you know, the you know, major trauma centres 
that there's drive-bys from Doncaster as well, straight into Sheffield. So it's an established process, as you well know. I'm sure you know it, it's it's something that evolves as specialties uh, evolve uh, within within their own departments. But therein lied another problem because you were on the border of Nottinghamshire Ambulance Service and South Yorkshire Ambulance Service, and so you took the right decision at the time to uh, rent the minibus. But the cost of that is quite high. So from your point of view, surely it must be worth uh, sorting the issues out with EMAS and um, Yorkshire Ambulance Service because that's a real issue for people as well because they need direction where to take the patients on emergency case. So, you know, and the, why, why have a minibus? I know why you had the minibus initially so that you could move your patients that were coming over, but that cost surely would be better off spent somewhere else if you could get the ambulance service to get their act together. I'll let Kevin take over anyway. I'll acquiesce there. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right, I'll, before we let Kevin in, um, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll do a bit of a sandwich. So we'll put John Doddy on next. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Keith. Um, I think everybody's getting used to these nine o'clock and ten o'clock curfews now with uh, COVID in the air. So it's a good time to have a curfew. So um, I think Idris and Timothy, you can relax for a couple of months at least. Um, I was curious, I mean, this is a capital investment, obviously, and it does nothing, as David says, to uh, change around to sheer numbers of staff from one thing and another. We're getting very used to, uh, certainly in general practice, the use of technology. So we're sending dermatology pictures to dermatologists, we're sending x-rays, we're sending results, we're sending everything in, a, in I, I call it clever, it's clever for me, might not be clever for other people. Send a, a lot of stuff and we're getting immediate responses back on ECGs and things. And technology has actually created the illusion of a person on site the illusion of an immediate care situation. And I'm wondering going forward whether or not Bassett Law needs to illusion in order to deal with kids who turn up. They could certainly be seen by video call, they could certainly be seen by a consultant that exists elsewhere and looked at and analysed. The rashes could be pictured and sent. And there's a huge amount that I think that technology can replace whereby the, the actual people themselves might not be on hand. What element of that going forward, Timothy and Idris, do you think is going to be useful in Bassett Law? Shall I come in on that point, Chair? Yeah. Um, I think, can I just clarify that we, we have uh, a consultant paediatrician available 24-7 uh, covering Bassett Law site and middle, middle tier and more junior tiers of junior doctors present uh, throughout the day, uh, 24 hours a day uh, throughout the year. Um, and in A&E, um, as I say, there are the two paediatric trained nurses on all the time. So patients who turn up, children who turn up, will be assessed uh, by the professionals. So there's no, there's no worry about that aspect at all. Um, I think the co-location of areas would, would um, coalesce two small services into one that's bigger than the sum of its parts. And I think that's a useful thing to think about uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about where we go forwards. Um, yes, technology has really taken off. I mean, I, I, I've never been to one of your meetings before. I've not been invited, but um, I can't imagine you doing this two years ago. Um, and, you know, in the hospitals, we're doing telephone consultations, video consultations, and all the things that you're talking about uh, using um, dermatology images and ECG images. And it's it's just jolted us into a new world. And, it, and it's worked really well in most areas, not everywhere, and there are caveats to what we do. Um, we can certainly seek um, opinions from uh, Doncaster or beyond, not forgetting that uh, the paediatricians who work at Bassett Law all rotate through Doncaster anyway, so it's the same cohort of uh, senior doctors, um, so we've got that sk same skill set. Uh, accessing information from Sheffield isn't difficult, uh, but these new technologies will enable that. Thank you. Do you want to come back, Johnny? All right. Uh, uh, no, it's, it, it's back then to the numbers, really. Uh, but uh, I, I think that, that, that there's a clear uh, um, desire to return a high level of care to Bassett Law and, and hopefully reassure the residents. Thanks very much. Brilliant. OK, uh, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, 
Councillor Doddy's uh, put his finger on it there. Uh, if, we, if only we could have uh, an illusion of nurses in Bassett Law, it'd be handy, wouldn't it? Uh, um, yeah, it's been it's going on for nearly four years now of transferring children to uh, Doncaster, which now at a cost of close to three million. Uh, that's how much it's gone up, three million. Now, just imagine that sum. I'm asking other members of this committee that's the price of transferring children from Bassett Law to, Notti uh, to Doncaster overnight. Even children that may want to be, only need to be in, uh, in, in the ward for overnight observation. Three million it's cost, cost us. That's an horrendous sum. I'm sure, I'm sure with that amount of money, Bassett Law could have uh, recruited nurses at that sum. Three million. And I think a lot of people uh, will be looking at this uh, meeting, a lot of residents of Bassett Law will be looking at this meeting and be absolutely staggered in the amount of money that's wasted absolutely wasted transferring children to Doncaster. And now we've got COVID. So it's not like it were. Things have changed. Things have changed dramatically for us all. And for the civil, uh, civil future, it's going to change. We've closed down the maternity ward at Bassett Law. So we're asking young mothers now to get themselves to Doncaster. So with this COVID epidemic, it's travel less, not more. And I think that needs to be took into account of children traveling from workshop to Doncaster, young mothers traveling from workshop to Doncaster, when we've got a perfect facility up there for maternity. Why at this time are we ferrying mothers to Doncaster, and is that going to be uh, reviewed? And also, can I ask, do you welcome Bassett Law District Council's help in recruiting NHS staff for you by opening uh, a training centre in Worksop to help recruit nurses and NHS staff for yourself? with the help of Sheffield University and Derbyshire University, that will soon be coming on stream now. Do you welcome Bassett Law Councils giving you help in recruiting your staff? Thank you, Chair. Shall I try and pick up um, those issues? And again, I'll, I'll come back to you, Tim, if you've got you. some additional things you want to yeah. add. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, it is expensive. Um, I must admit, Councillor, I hadn't done the maths, but uh, I don't, uh, I don't doubt your, your arithmetic. I am. Uh, um, the closure was never uh, for financial reasons, and obviously that is significant investment in order to try and maintain the quality and the timeliness uh, and the safety of the service. That was what was absolutely paramount. That's why we had to close it in the first place. Uh, in terms of being able to recruit. As you know, there are national pay scales for nurses, so we're fairly restricted on how you could uh, sort of entice you know, sort of people in. So I think the same issues arise as we've already gone through in terms of recruitment, unfortunately. Uh, in terms of the count, Vassal or District Council, absolutely we do welcome that, and we're working very closely um, sort of with them. So I've uh, got a member of my team as part of the Integrated Care Partnership who's actively involved in the development of that, supporting the council. Uh, so yeah, uh, very much welcome that. Uh, just on the maternity issue, um, the plan is that we will reopen the maternity unit in November because we've been able to recruit midwives. So we've had obviously issues during COVID in terms of staffing and as you know, COVID has impacted on staffing and sickness absence levels and so on. Uh, but we've been delighted that we had 
they, that the hospital had a successful recruitment sort of campaign and has managed to recruit um, so those midwives. So COVID notwithstanding, because uh, we have to respond to the situation as it arises, but the plan is that that will reopen in November. Dr Noble, is there anything you wish to add? Yes, if you don't mind, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Councillor Grease. Uh, I, I also don't know the sums, but I, I don't doubt your, your arithmetic. Um, the intention when we've spent that to transfer the children is to keep them safe and offer them a safe um, environment for them to be cared for. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a significant sum, but it was a circumstance we were faced with at the time. I would agree with Idris. It's difficult to use that money um, prospectively to entice staff. Um, uh, the mechanisms for doing that aren't, aren't really available to us. Um, I am very clear about the maternity as well, that we do have a review date and in, an intended return of the service back uh, to Bassett Law. And again, to just to reiterate, as Idris has said, that was again because of midwife shortages. We had an inherent um, uh, lack of midwives and a difficulty recruiting. And then, of course, you quite rightly point out the great complexities of COVID, which um, meant that any pregnant midwives, of which there were quite a few, couldn't come to work um, and be patient facing. So that again took out another um, cohort of our staff, which um, is for their safety. We don't want them to be um, uh, vulnerable to COVID. So um, we ha had to do what we had to do at that point, but it's temporary. Uh, and you know, I've been firmly involved with maternity for quite some time. Uh, we know it has to move back uh, and uh, the dates are, are set for that. Um, intrigued by the offer of the council to support training centre and supporters with development, because I think that would be great. Um, and I and I'm a great believer. I'm a local. I'm a local person. I I use Bassett Law A and E with my children. I have done. Um, you know, I'm a local person, and I'm a great believer in locally recruiting people to work in our local <coughs> services because you know you've got a a, a vested interest in, um, in in supporting the environment uh, around you. So very happy to hear what we do with that. <clears throat> yeah, okay, Kevin. Anything to come back on? Just, just one uh, thing. I, I, uh, I welcome the. It is going to open in November. I take it. It is November that maternity ward will reopen. Okay, and uh, I'm quite surprised, Timothy, that uh, Idris didn't tell you about the uh, uh, the Bassett Law initiative to uh, open very soon. I believe the uh, training centre. Uh, maybe you should get together more often sometimes. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm delighted Sorry. to say, though, uh, Councillor, that the uh, Doncaster and Bassett Law HR Director is involved in it. <laughs> oh, lovely. Uh, OK, I've got Muriel next, please. Oh, thanks. Um, and thanks for this paper. It's both aspirational and, uh, and pretty focused, so it's it's really encouraging. Uh, just a question about mental health services. I see that um, the comment is we want to improve access to a wider range of specialist mental health support. I'd just, just like to hear a bit more of that in detail. And also I'd be interested to hear how stretched CAMS is in, uh, in Bassett Law, because it's very stretched um, in, in my patch in Gedling. It, it's um, youngsters are being um, assessed and then not not being taken into uh, even short-term programmes. So I just wondered if the situation was better in Bassett Law. Thank you. Dr Johnson, you want to pick that up? Yes, um, the, the ward up at Bassett Law at, at the moment, it's one of these wards where we've got the dormitory style accommodation and we've got mixed gender and we want to be looking at that but I think your, your question was mainly around what extra access would it get if um, uh, what it misses out on I think that's mainly aimed at when somebody comes in um, we need to gauge how unwell they are people who are yeah. really very unwell and there's a risk of needing more intense facilities such as psychiatric intensive care or backup of more staff that's a lot easier where there's more staff around to back them up. Does that answer your question? So did you perhaps just give me an example of um, where the where the service would be improved. 
Well, say um, if somebody comes in who's um, detained and psychotic and really unwell and might need to go into a psychiatric intensive care unit, then then um, it's risky to admit direct to Bassett Law uh, because we don't have the staff that can be called upon to support if those needs are there and we're at some distance from the specialist settings. Right, so when when you talk about improving access to a wider range of specialist mental health support what what will that uh, what will that be offering that that isn't around at the moment it'll offer some of the the specialist psychology services support for personality disorder support for intensive care needs particularly um and and the range of um substance misuse and other services that oh, okay. we've got more intensively into the other wards. Um, we've got okay. a wider range of specialists leading other wards as well. Okay, thank you. And what about CAMS? What what state is CAMS in up there? I think CAMS isn't is is similar across the the patch. Um, it's similar weights. I, I don't know if um, Jan wants to come in on that. It, it's not a different service in Bassett Law from Mid Knots or South Knots. Oh no, I appreciate that. I just wondered how it plays out in you know in the day to day, really. Maybe if I could just say so. I, th I think um, yeah, I think um, prob neither myself nor Hazel could probably give you a. a, a a, a good solid answer to that council wise just because um, we haven't got any cams information with us at, at the moment because okay. um the basset law um uh, issues for us are around uh, adult mental health services and mental health yep. services for older people but okay. if you you know if you wanted to contact us outside of the meeting we could certainly make some inquiries for you about your your patch if, if you'd like us to do that i'll say well i said perhaps chair it might be worth putting the present state of CAM services on the work programme. I've, I've already done it, Mary. I've just written it down. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sharon. OK, that takes us on then to Liz, please. Am I up? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, well, I obviously welcome the report and the aims behind it. Um, and obviously, I'm not a Bassett Law member, but I mean, this seems to me a, a perfect example of the inequalities in access to health services within our county. And it's not, it's not, you know, the recruitment issue is nothing new. Um, I mean, it does concern me that um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, Bassett Road is not the only area in the country that is having difficulty um, getting the right staff in the right, you know, in, in the right departments. Um, and, and, in, and sort of in my view, without a doubt, this is an issue um, that should be addressed nationally. I mean, we, I've been on this uh, committee, what, for three years now, um, and it's the same thing that, you know, there is a problem, a general problem in recruitment, um, but obviously if you're at the um, Queen's University Hospital or the city, you've got far better chance of getting the staff that you require than you have in the, you know, obviously in Worksop, Bassett, Law, and up north of the county and other areas of the country. So. To me, it's still, it really is something that should be addressed nationally. Um, but my question in terms of this report really is, we've got the next steps. You've got phase one, phase two, phase three within this report. And I'm just wondering what timelines are actually being put against these stages. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, so as you say, it is a national issue. Um, so not entirely under our sort of control. Uh, I think in terms of the stages, uh, we're looking really, and I'd welcome sort of your views on this, uh, to go into an engagement exercise uh, over the autumn and through the winter, which would then conclude uh, at the beginning of 2021. Uh, and then a decision being made, you know, sort of in light of that engagement exercise. Um, fairly early in 2021. Uh, so we want to ensure that we've got enough time, uh, particularly because of COVID, to have really effective engagement. So if that gives you a sort of an idea of the, the, the timescales. So we've got 
about a month where we're going to consider your views and the views of other key stakeholders and then several months of engagement and then decision in the new year. OK. Do you want to come back on anything, Liz? Um, only in the fact that, yes, so in terms of putting things in place, sort of where does that come along the line? OK, so some things are interdependent and others are not. So uh, the co-location, if we go down that route, um, of the paediatric services in both the unit itself and the a and &E is then dependent on securing the capital monies that the Prime Minister promised during the election, but obviously then carrying out those works. Uh, if, um, if we relocate mental health inpatients, then again, it will be dependent on sort of the availability of that accommodation. So you're looking at uh, sort of into the next financial year, probably. Um, so April onwards in 2021 to start making the changes. OK, happy, Liz. Lost Sorry, you. yes, thank you. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Stuart then, please. Hello, thank you for uh, uh, for what you've gone through already. <clears throat> I don't want to seem like being a wet blanket, but whenever I read these type of reports, they're almost visionable statements. And the problem I always find is that people will always then take it outside. So, for example, after I've made that statement, for example, as I read it, they're looking at three particular areas in which to spend the £15 million on capital spending. But yet we floated off to such things as um, uh, maternity services, etc. And I think if you want a response from people, etc., you almost sometimes need to put down what the basic part of the vision is and allow it to be developed there rather than coming along and asking for people to give you something because you'll get far more than you wanted and certainly things that you could never find the money for or indeed be able to put it in because of other reasons. So uh, that would be one of, one of uh, my issues um, or the main thing. You need to tie, I think, you need to tighten this document down when you're going out, at, uh, out to the public. And equally, and I know that you do, but equally, it's also getting out that message as to why certain circumstances apply. For example, um, there aren't a, a factory where nurses and midwives are trained and pushed out, etc. on the press of a button. It's a four year minimum uh, programme. Um, midwifery went out some years ago. Mid midwifery was the thing that everybody wanted to do. So you had lots of midwives. They've all, some of them have then got married, had children, etc., and left. Equally, other people don't want going to midwifery, and it goes on for consultants and it goes on for the doctors. And I think that's part of the argument that also needs to be put within this document. But I do wish you well. Coming from Newark, where we've gone through all this and most of the services have been stripped out of uh, uh, Newark, etc. I fully understand why my colleagues would want to fight and retain and get more uh, investment in there. But I, I, I wish you the best. Thank you, Councillor. I very much welcome those, those comments. Uh, and particularly because this is the pre-engagement point, then we can refine the language we use and how tight you know sort of the, uh, the, the that engagement is so I'm very much welcome that uh, I think uh, and your points about uh, the context of this with nurse training things and things that we can include as well uh, the CCGs retains its commitment to try and provide as many services as locally as possible for the residents so we're very keen to do whatever we can working with provider colleagues uh, to continue that and as long as those services can be maintained sustainably and uh, provided a good quality, then uh, then we'll we'll keep those services local. And anything else, Stuart? No, no, thank you. No, it's, it's okay. Anybody that's not spoken like to speak? Now I've just got a couple of things then, really, because you've I, I noticed you've asked a couple of three times, in, in our opinion. 
or views on uh, sort of uh, engagement, really, so it's just methods of engagement. And I know that, um, uh, I think it was last year that the County Council did a survey <coughs> out to residents ask, asking for opinions on things. Um, I think we got about 4,000 responses, but uh, I do know that uh, Newcombe District Council did the same thing and got 14,000 responses. And it might be worth you going to Bassett Law District Council and, and see if they've done something similar. Because what we did, as, uh, uh, sorry, what we did, what Newark and Sherwood did as a result of those responses was set up a, a residence panel yeah, of go-to people who wanted to be uh, talked about, about all sorts of issues. So that might be a, a way of getting, getting to people uh, more directly um, and doing it that way, really. Um, it's just an option. I don't know uh, Bassett Law. I'm, I'm new and myself, uh, but I do know that they did that that survey and the response was quite phenomenal, really, of which we learnt a lot about our, what people felt about our services and indeed about the county council services. Uh, I just want to bring one one thing up, really, just to see if if it's been progressed or not. Back in uh, 2017, when it, when uh, this first came to the committee when I was on it, and I know <laughs> Councillor Greaves at that time was very animated about um, what was happening there, and rightly so, uh, is defending his patch. One of the things that was suggested by this committee was that um, you rotate staff round throughout throughout your CCG, basically. Um, and it, it, it was suggested that that wasn't really possible because of the fact of contracts, people's contracts. You couldn't really um, persuade them to, to move round as part of their education and training really uh, but it was also then said well why why moving forward don't you start with your new contracts with people include that within the contract and and i just wonder have you started doing that uh, and if not why not because to me you know it, it's one I, i'm an ex-military guy and, and and training is everything absolutely everything and they used to stick you yeah, in all sorts of places in all sorts of conditions and circumstances with all sorts of different groups and that's how you learn different ways of doing things and 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 how to how to be good at your job yeah and to me that seems quite a logical um logical thing to do within within the nhs services you know because it's all very well and good being in a nice swish hospital with everything there and that everything's at your disposal to do your job but actually, sometimes, you know, it's good that you haven't got everything there. You have to improvise. You have to do adapt and overcome things. And, and maybe by moving people around, you'll then raise the quality of, of the people that you're employing. So to me, that if you haven't done that, that's, that's, that's a missed opportunity. Um, and if you haven't done that, are you going to do it? Uh, and if not, why not? I'll let Dr. Noble come in in a second. <laughs> I... I... <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember the conversation well. Um, I, I think I'd just make a couple of observations because I, I think staff are rotated around and as part of training and things, but um, Dr. Noble will be able to answer that, I think, more fully. Uh, but of course, it presupposes that you actually get more staff if you rotate them or that we've got more staff than we need at Doncaster and not, neither of those are the case. So I, I, I've got nothing against sort of rotating and improving the training of, of staff on different sides, but it doesn't mean that you get more staff to be able to, you know, sort of staff both units 24 seven. Uh, and I think the, the observation, and I know it came up in the conversation a few years ago uh, about does it make it more or less attractive to recruit if you rotate? Well, in part, it depends on how you do it. Yeah, sort of if you're in one place one day and another place another day. Uh, but um, there was some concern that if you rotate them on a very regular basis, that would make um, the job less attractive. But that's not that that's not the reason why it isn't done, because it is. Um, but the reason why it doesn't actually allow you to open the unit 24-7 is a different one. That's the, the ability to recruit staff. But Dr. Noble, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Idris, and thank you, Chair. There's a valid point, and we do rotate staff. Um, people have a contract with DBTH, and they have a base hospital. Uh, the contract says you will potentially work on any of our four sites. 
Uh, I personally have worked at Retford, Mexborough, uh, Bassetlaw and Doncaster in a week. Uh, that's quite difficult. Um, so as Idris says, um, it is important how you do it. Lots of our services are rotational. Um, and you know, my, my predecessor was very keen that all the medical specialties, you know, all the doctors uh, had rotational elements to their jobs. They don't all, for good reasons in some cases, um, but we do rotate staff. Um, and as Idris says, it doesn't get more staff, but it does actually um, increase the offer in terms of training opportunities, exposure to different conditions uh, and different working environments. So it, it, it's certainly a, a healthy option that we have and the contract, um, no one can say I won't rotate. The contract doesn't allow you to say that. OK, thank you for that. Uh, OK, that, that concludes uh, this item then. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm not sure when we're going to want, um, want them back. Have we got any ideas? Uh, anybody got any ideas? What we'll do is we'll contact you. Uh, sorry, Martin, did you put your hand up then? Perhaps springtime. Spring? Yeah, ex exactly, Muriel. I, um, I was going to suggest about springtime. Okay. Uh, when, when the um, CCG have, have got their plans together on how they will engage so we can have, so we can pass comments on the methodology they're using. Okay, that, that, just, just for clarity, that's the county council spring, not a government spring, which it tends to be about October, November time. <laughs> when, uh, when, they, when they say they're going to bring a paper out in spring, it yeah. often means October, <laughs> November. So, yeah, we, we do mean spring. Um, so we, I'll leave Martin uh, to, um, uh, Martin Gately, our officer, to uh, organise that with you and, and, and bring that forward. Thank you very much for, for attending our meeting. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that takes us on then to item seven. Uh, to introduce this item, following the cancellation of some meetings during the lockdown period, the work programme has had to be revised and rescheduled. I now invite Martin Gately to comment in more detail. Thank you very much, Chairman. So um, all I would say is members should now be aware that we've got an additional meeting of the Health Scrutiny Committee for the 14th of October. And that's when we'll be looking at the consultation results from the National Rehabilitation Centre and also looking at um, the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on mental health, including the support given to NHS staff. So further to this meeting, I've noted that members want to look at the present state of CAMS at a future meeting. Obviously, we'll add that into the work programme. Just wondering, Chair, if there's any other issues that members want to add in while we're discussing the work programme? OK, open to you, anybody. Stick your hands up. Um, Kevin? Thank you, Chair. I just couldn't get to me mechanical hand <laughs> fast enough. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, access to GP appointments. Um, uh, as a group, we were, uh, Labour group, were discussing uh, uh, earlier in the week. Uh, the difficulty of some people accessing uh, GP appointments, and it's it's not a level playing field. It seems to be sporadic throughout the area. Uh, I, in with the doctor, my doctors where I, um, I have no problem really. Well, uh, more of a problem than it used to be, but I can still get to see them. But in my ward that I represent, uh, the residents here are having extreme. Uh, difficulty in accessing their uh, doctors. So I wonder if that could be brought forward. I know it was on the uh, uh, on the uh, work programme for referrals. I wonder if that could be brought forward at all. Yeah, yeah, OK, we'll do that. OK, I'll note to that, Chairman. Anybody else want to? Just one, uh, please. Oh, Stuart. Sorry, uh, Stuart, yeah. So, sorry, um, did you say the 14th of October? we were having the additional meeting. I think I did say that, yes. Um, because it's it knocks me out. I've got a meeting at 9.30 and then both um, we have a Conservative group meeting at 10.30. We're in the afternoon. Are we in the afternoon? Yeah, it's in the afternoon, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's you've not, have we sent that one out? Yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's been in the afternoon, Mark. Uh, yeah. Thank you. In the afternoon, Thank Stuart, you. because be because quiet. in the morning, in the morning, you've got a meeting and there's also a group meeting. Yeah, have you said that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we put it in the afternoon. Au revoir. Yeah. <laughs> Au revoir. Okay, is that it? No, agenda, chair. Agenda's indicated. Oh, sorry, sorry, agenda. Thank you, chair. Um, 
looking at the work program, um, Councillor Kevin mentioned primary care. And in addition to that, something perhaps scrutiny committee in county needs to consider is this new thing, Armageddon coming, NHS 111 first. And they, I, I'm not sure if uh, Chair uh, must be aware, um, but CCG is uh, looking to start consultation on this NHS 111 first. Um, it might be a good idea to actually consider it. That's, that would be my view. Okay. Thank Fine. you. Yeah, absolutely no problem. No problem at all. Lovely. Is that it, everybody? Thank you very much for your attendance and your contributions, and I'll see you all at the next meeting, which is in Thank the you. afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After the conservative meeting. Bye-bye. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Jeremy.